in the spring, I interviewed Jagmeet Singh here, and then Andrew Shear, and, um, and then we made the other guy wait and sweat a bit, but finally he, we're going to let him talk. Uh, I want you all to give a warm welcome to the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau. I asked you uh, just before we came on whether it's too early for you to be looking forward to the house rising again uh, <laughs> since it just got back. Uh, what's the difference between last week and this week for you? Um, a little more structure this week. Uh, I'm uh, in the house, which means uh, more time at home uh, every night with my kids. Uh, not every night, but most nights. Uh, it, it's an opportunity to engage in actually getting big things done. Uh, it's great to be out there meeting with Canadians, hearing from their concerns, talking with them, engaging. Uh, we had a great caucus meeting in Saskatoon uh, last week as well. So lots of, lots of good energy, great conversations. But, you know, House of Parliament is where things get done, and that's, uh, that's what we stayed focused on. Um, the kind of rumour around Ottawa is that if you were to write a list of your ten favourite places to be, the House of Commons might not be on that list. Ten favorite places? It, it could it could very well be. It's a, it's an important place. It's an important place where, no, the level of um, debate sometimes doesn't you know, meet the same bar as you get around a a, a table in a diner or a, or a, you know a, a barbecue. Uh, but there are important things achieved and done, and everything that historians will look back on is on record in, in Hansard in this place. And it's, there's a sense of the importance of what we're collectively doing for Canadians while we pass through the house. The permanence of that building reminds us that we are passing through for a little while. And we better do right by all the voices that came before us and all the voices that will come later. So I, I like it as a touchstone. Wouldn't want to have to spend every single day of, uh, of the year there. Uh, but it's an important place to respect. I thought we would uh, settle into the conversation tonight. You have moose socks on. <laughs> I was, mine, mine are in. They're Paul Wells socks. They're very demure. <laughs> um, <laughs> I thought we'd settle in tonight by uh, reminiscing your favorite memories of working with Leona Alislev, uh, your colleague from uh, Ontario. Uh, she was, um, I remember doing a fundraiser with her when she was a candidate. Uh, she was uh, you know, thoughtful uh, about her, her approach, um, you know, knew she was in a, a riding that leaned conservative, but very excited about uh, uh, giving a, a chance to hear the kinds of priorities we had and sell them to, uh, to her, uh, her constituents who, uh, who Agreed and supported her. So you know, I wish her I wish her the best in her her new choices. Um, and uh, you know that's something that that happens from time to time in politics. It's not it's not great, but it's also not um, the be all and end all. I mean, it's a very sort of okay. One team lost a member and it went to the other side. It can be an indicator of larger things. It can be just what it is. Uh, and we'll just stay focused on on the things that we're focused on doing. She narrowly won her riding in 2015, and in 2018, in the provincial election just finished, the Liberal candidate in that riding got creamed by the Conservative. And that only happened in that riding, right? Are there, well, that's, that's <laughs> I assume someone in your office has done the math. Are there other members of Parliament who could do the, the same sort of math and... You know, I'm, I, I certainly don't think so. Uh, I think we have, uh, I mean, we just had a great caucus meeting in Saskatoon where uh, people were charged up, excited about the upcoming year, excited about all the things we'd, uh, we've done, um, you know, focused on the, uh, the next things we have to do and the opportunity to, uh, to campaign uh, with Canadians over the coming year. Is Doug Ford's election in Ontario a signal. Is there are, are there messages? Are there lessons that you should learn from that election? I think uh, any election offers its its lessons. I don't know that there's uh, a lot of them that I would apply directly to us. But certainly, you know, looking at uh, the fears and anxieties that are out there is something that I've often talked about. 
there are political parties out there that do a pretty good job of stoking up those fears and, and uh, exaggerating the anxieties and looking for clever wedges. I've always tried not to do that. I think we've focused on bringing people together and putting forward thoughtful solutions that hopefully will allay those fears instead of exaggerating them. But we know that that, that strain of politics is out there, and as, as Doug Ford showed, it can be very effective. Speaking of that strain of politics, I wanted to talk about your relationship with uh, President Trump and the, 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 the one file there was no way I could avoid uh, talking about tonight, which is NAFTA. Do you have any sense of uh, an end to this story approaching? I mean, you've been careful not to accept as written in stone almost any deadline that others have sought to impose on this process. Does that mean it's just never going to end? I'm going to retire on this thing? Uh, no, I certainly hope not. I think, I think people are, are, you know, every time we get momentum, every time we work together, we do knock off a few more things and move closer to an eventual, uh, an eventual decision point. Uh, we're not there yet. Uh, there were points in the spring where we thought we were perhaps days or weeks away. It turned out not to be the case. We might be days or weeks away now. We, it might not be. This is uh, really something that we're engaged in, in a, you know, as I've said, in a, in a thoughtful and, and positive way. If there's a good deal to be had for Canada, which I think there is, then, then we, will, uh, we will look to sign it. If it's not the right deal for Canada, we won't sign it. I think that's what I've heard from Canadians as being uh, you know, fairly basic in their expectations of me. It's got to be a frustrating process from a communications point of view because uh, it, it's swallowing up large parts of your day and most of your foreign minister's job, and yet there's, there's very limited amounts of it that you could communicate to us. Uh, because you, all sides have sworn not to communicate in, or to negotiate in public. Yeah, yeah but, but it's a really big and really important thing. So I don't, I don't feel that just because we can't you know, go and shout it from the rooftops every day, I don't feel that we're not you know, doing really big things and important things. I mean, there's a sense that this job, and I know this may come as a, as a shock to some of the journalists, but it is defined by what we actually do, not what people say about what we do. Okay, I, I dispute that. Um, <laughs> does it from the inside feel like a coherent uh, process where the, uh, the reactions of all parties are uh, logical and consistent with, with uh, what other sides have said and done? Or is it just one damn thing after another? Uh, no, I think there, there certainly are, are narrative threads to pull from what the president has said and what, uh, what the negotiators are, are pushing for. Uh, and our job is is to you know stay strong on on our positions and look for ways where we can you know reach to mutually beneficial outcomes. So, you know the 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 public narrative is not something that I spend a lot of time worrying about either from our side or their side. We're just very much focused on trying to do the work and get to the right outcome, which in itself uh, may sound like a simple thing, but uh, in these current times is is not. Okay. And is it a fluid process? Is it changing all the time? Or uh, have you known for weeks or months what concessions you were, were being demanded of you and what, you know, where you're going to have to saw off to get a deal? Um, you know, we're, we're getting into, into some of the details that I'd rather not get into. We've been very clear for a long time uh, about where, where our issues were. I've been clear with them in public as well. Um, and the Americans have their take on that that is you know, sometimes consistent and sometimes evolves. There are two moments that the Americans, that the Trump administration complains about as having been uh, needless irritants to this process. One is uh, the post-summit news conference that you gave in Charlevoix after the G7. And one is a speech that Minister Freeland gave in Washington when she was accepting an award. If you had to play either of those over again, would you do them differently? No. Okay. Do exactly the same thing. Why was it really important for Minister Freeland to give that speech in Washington? Uh, because, as I've said from the very beginning, Canadians expect me, particularly with this administration, expect us as a government to do two very important things. One is uh, have a constructive relationship with um, the American government, uh, and two, continue to stand up clearly and strongly for our values. Uh, and our principles and Canadian interests. And doing both of those things simultaneously sometimes bump up against each other, but I think it's also extremely important to highlight, including to uh, Americans, exactly who we are and where we stand. Okay. 
Meanwhile, um, your foreign minister, whose remit theoretically is the entire world, is stuck in Washington for two weeks a month and, uh, and is the only NAFTA foreign minister with direct line responsibility for the NAFTA negotiations. Uh, uh, Pompeo in, in uh, Washington is not responsible for NAFTA. Videgaray in Mexico City isn't. Is that a lost opportunity, having Christopher Freeland so tightly bound to these negotiations? Uh, no, I think it's a reflection of the importance of our relationship with the United States for our economy, that uh, we consider that, that our engagement with the world you know, passes through uh, the work that Christia is doing. But she's not down there on her own. She has an extraordinary team of trade negotiators, of, of uh, support from you know, different offices, from uh, uh, the ambassador's office. And there's a bit of a rotating cast around, uh, around the table. She's not always there. Uh, but this is something that we're willing to make sure we take seriously enough to put, uh, put our best people in. Okay. I want to pull back the um, international camera a little bit from the NAFTA table and, and talk about the global situation with regard to democracy. Mm -hmm. um, Freedom House is, a, is an NGO based out of Washington that releases an annual report on the state of democracy. And their reports have been increasingly worried from year to year. The 2018 report is called The Crisis of Democracy. It, by their count, in 71 countries around the world, uh, rights and, and freedoms uh, took a step back or even more than that last year. 71 took a step back, 35 took a step forward, and they say it's the 12th consecutive year in which democracy has declined around the world. What did they say about Canada? Uh, okay, decent. They say, they say Canada's doing pretty well. I bet if I asked the it leaders... It was so of, hard for him to say, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> You're a very good impartial journalist, Paul, don't worry. I bet if I asked the heads of Freedom House, they would, they would, they would hope that Canada could, could do even more than it already does to advance the cause of democracy around the world. Indeed. Um, are, do you have concrete ideas on how that could happen? Oh, very much. We're uh, hosting a Global Progress Summit, as we did last year, uh, upcoming this weekend in Montreal, where uh, I'll be sitting down with the new Prime Minister of Spain, uh, who is a, uh, a strong, uh, strong progressive voice uh, on the world stage. I, had, uh, uh, I have obviously a great working relationship with uh, Emmanuel Macron, uh, and, uh, and that was uh, and Angela Merkel. They were very uh, helpful in moving forward on the G7 commitments we made. There's, uh, there's a lot of people around the world in different ways, even someone like like uh, Theresa May, who uh, is not necessarily exactly the same place in the political spectrum. We have great conversations about protecting our democracy from the erosion of either less democratic states trying to knock us down or, or tendencies towards polarization uh, around the world. Where do you suppose those tendencies come from? I mean, we've, we've seen troubling trends in Poland, in Hungary, in, uh, in Italy, uh, to a lesser extent, in Turkey. Um, uh, Countries that to some extent we thought we could depend on for many years and, and now things are going a little sideways. How come? I think, I think it's a reflection of one of the great challenges in our you know, Western developed economies, but actually quite around the world, is that after the, the boom years of the past you know, 70 years or so, uh, the middle class in our countries, whatever you, however you choose to define it or call it, um, doesn't feel like it is being well supported as the world is changing around them, whether it's climate change, whether it's uh, new technologies, AI, automation, whether it's uh, you know, new arrivals, whether it's offshoring of jobs. There's a lot of sources of anxiety, and I think there are many political parties and actors who have realized that there is a path to short-term gain uh, by exacerbating those differences, by playing up those fears, by looking to point fingers and lay blame. Uh, and that is, is catching. Fear is, fear is contagious. And we're seeing that, that success uh, erode some of the trust, public trust in institutions, which then uh, creates a cycle of those institutions being, becoming less trustworthy. Um. There's a constant danger in Western democracies, which is that if, if, if uh, everyone doesn't feel like the system is delivering for them, they will reject the system. Uh, we saw... I'm not sure I agree with that. I think that's, that's, that's a, a challenge out there, 
but I can give you plenty of examples, particularly here in Canada, uh, where people aren't voting on you know, what is the very best for me, and instead, uh, what is uh, going to benefit my community, what is going to benefit uh, my, my region, what is going to benefit my whole country. I think if you treat voters like uh, you know, all that's in it for them is who's going to come out with a better, better outcome, who's going to buy them off better in the election, then they will respond to that. But if you make a compelling case for the direction we're going in and how we can be better if we all succeed together, uh, then they will rise to that. But it really depends on how you choose to speak to your voters and how you choose to treat them like intelligent, thoughtful, value-driven citizens instead of just uh, you know, short-term consumers of whatever it is a political party is selling. Okay. Um, maybe we can test those assertions uh, in a concrete uh, setting, which is the continuing drama uh, dispute over the people who are walking across the border in Quebec and Ontario and Manitoba. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I've wondered in this debate over the last few months whether some people, your government, is getting too hung up on vocabulary. Are these irregular or illegal border crossers? Your own uh, immigration Minister Ahmed Hussein is, has said he uses both terms interchangeably. And then a few months later, a few months later though, he called um, Lisa McLeod, the Ontario Minister, un-Canadian because he, he was taking issue with some of the terms she was using. Um, is it helpful to play language cop on things like this? I think you have to look at what sort of the underlying uh, good we are trying to protect. Canada is one of those few countries in the world right now that is Canadians are genuinely and positively disposed towards immigration. So we have a country that has seen how the waves of immigration coming to this country have benefited us all and created tremendous prosperity alongside tremendous cultural and neighborhood richness and resilience. Protecting that, uh, particularly at this time of division and anxiety around the world, is and should be really job one for all politicians. We, we can, we can you know, criticize handling it this way, handling it that way. Could you do it better? Could we do this better? But undermining people's faith in immigration is something that I think has potential dangerous long-term consequences that we might not be, or not everyone might be fully cognizant of. That's why when we talk about it, we're, we're, we're focused on reassuring people that yes, this is a challenge. Over the past year and a half, a lot more people have chosen to leave the United States to come to Canada uh, by crossing a border at a, a, a non-legal and an irregular crossing. Um, it is illegal to cross the border in uh, a non-official point of entry, which means uh, they are illegally crossing. Uh, for which uh, they uh, would be arrested were it not for the fact that they're making an asylum claim. As soon as you make an asylum claim, our responsibility is to flow them through our asylum system. We're doing that. Yes, it's, it's a challenge because there are more than have passed before, but we have the resources and we have the capacity to check uh, everyone's um, criminal and, and security records. Uh, we have the capacity to put them through our process. Uh, and we are applying that process. So are there things that we can be criticized on it? I'm sure there are, absolutely. But is it something you want to make Canadians panicked about uh, or, or create fears or bring uh, newly arrived Canadians to worry that uh, because these people are crossing regularly somehow their place or their, their, their pathways or their parents opportunities are less? There's a bit of pitting communities against communities there that I don't think serves the country we're trying to build, regardless of which side of the political spectrum you're on. Okay. It's clearly a subject of preoccupation, though. You put Bill, Bill Blair in at a senior level as a minister responsible for this. You've done some shuffling of cabinet committees around this. Uh, this is something that you don't want to see grow out of hand. No, I think, uh, as I said, protecting Canadians' positive perception towards immigration uh, is something that every government should be very mindful of. Okay. And is it appropriate to haggle with the Ontario government about the bill for all of this? Uh, well, we have, we have uh, come to excellent arrangements with Quebec on, on similar issues. Uh, we know that the, 
the provinces are taking on extra responsibilities because of this, and we're uh, happy to work with them to cover cover housing costs. The issue that that uh, Toronto originally, or sorry, that Ontario originally brought up with me was, uh, well, we don't want to have anything to do with it. You should just flow the money directly to the cities. And of course, we're happy to do that, uh, but that does have an impact on on you know, municipalities being creatures of the provinces, which you know. Fast forward a few weeks was an argument that, uh, that Doug Ford was happy to be making. Um, parenthetically, you're watching the uh, all-night debates in the Ontario legislature over the use of the notwithstanding clause. Um, and I, there's, there's word from Washington that President Trump is going to slap another $200 billion in tariffs on China. Um, I'm not going to bug you about the notwithstanding clause. You'll get enough of that over the next few months. But it sometimes seems that... Um, some of the newcomers to politics, the Trumps and the, and the Doug Fords, can do anything, can make any grand gesture, can move quickly. And the more traditional brokerage parties, like the one that you lead, seem constrained and hemmed in and tentative and incremental. Is it frustrating to watch these guys uh, pull their grand gestures while you're still consulting? Um, it really depends what you, what you want out of politics. I think it's, it's easy to pull off grand gestures if you're just thinking about today and maybe tomorrow's headlines. Uh, it's harder to do things that, that reach the two goals that I certainly put at the center of what our party's trying to do, which is one, make things better for Canadians in a real and durable long-term way with positive impacts right away, and, and two, reaffirm people's faith in governments and institutions as being able to serve them and able to actually do good things for them. When you're not too worried about you know, constitutional niceties or institutions like courts or, or what have you, um, you can take a mandate and, and make those grand gestures and you know, satisfy your base in, a, base in a very loud way. Does that contribute to the long-term well-being of citizens. Perhaps there's certainly a case that a smaller, a smaller municipal council uh, might do that. I've seen arguments on both sides, and I won't weigh in. But are you also eroding trust in institutions by calling into question the, the judiciary, uh, by, uh, by choosing to override people's fundamental rights uh, on such a process question? There's an argument, and certainly I believe, that it is better to get things right, even if it's a little more complicated, even if it takes a little longer. And ultimately, I believe that Canadians appreciate that. Okay. It's interesting, because in 2015, you ran as the agent of change. And all the, other, all the old guys in the other parties were saying, hey, he can't do that. Wait a minute, wait a minute. And now you're sounding a little bit more like the dad who is saying, I will pull this car over right now if you guys don't smarten up. <laughs> Uh, have you aged that quickly in office? I, I, I'm actually stunned that you're saying that because the things that we have done uh, to actually chif, shift the uh, economic trajectory that this country has been on have been significant. I mean, we put forward the Canada Child Benefit. We had uh, folks, including folks in the bowels of finance, Canada, finance saying, uh, you know what, that's not going to work. You can't do that. You can't do this. And we said, no, no, a means-tested child benefit, a family benefit, will absolutely grow the economy. And people were saying, you know, $22 billion is a lot of money, but on the scale of the entire Canadian economy, not much. And what we're actually seeing is more money in the pockets of the middle class and people working hard to join it uh, is actually uh, leading to more consumer confidence, better outcomes, and economic growth, the numbers which you can't refute. Okay. Let's move on to another hot file. So real change is real. <laughs> I'm told better is always possible. Uh, absolutely. And it will. Um, it will be. So let's talk about Trans Mountain. Mm. Um, about 10 days ago, you said you would uh, consider all options in response to the federal appeal court decision, um, blocking further work on that. Today, can you tell me whether you're closer to deciding whether the government will, for instance, appeal that decision to the Supreme Court? Well, I, I said, actually, even before, I said that obviously in any time you have an issue, you're going to consider all options. That's, that's pretty much one of those things that politicians can say and be right and be responsible about. Uh, the, 
the issue that I I've always said is my preference is to get this done in such a way as not just for this project, but for any future energy or infrastructure projects, we have a clear path and clarity. And the fact that the, that the uh, Federal Court of Appeals came back with a clear sort of road back and said, yes, you did some consultations with Indigenous people. You didn't quite go far enough. This is what you need to do. And uh, yes, you examined the environmental impacts and the science, but you didn't do this part of it, which you need to do. That's almost a really good thing. Because, I mean, it's super frustrating uh, because we much rather would not have had that decision. But having had that decision, they said, OK, if you do these two things, then the approval works. And that's actually the first time, or one of the first times, we've had clarity around that. So notwithstanding the fact that if that ruling had come down while, people, while the pipeline was still in private hands, the project would be dead. We have a, a larger tolerance for risk as a government. We absolutely want to get it done not to make a profit, but because it's in the national interest to get our oil resources to markets other than the United States, because right now we're totally prisoners of, of the United States market for, for our oil resources. So we say, OK, if we do these two things, then we will be able to get it built the right way, and that will provide a path for private corporations and private investors to create projects that will follow those kinds of instructions. So it's frustrating, but it comes down to the fact that we said, we're going to get these things done right. We're going to respect the science. We're going to work with communities, including and especially indigenous communities, and we'll grow the economy that way. And as someone who believes that that's really the only way to move the economy forward, uh, this is a continued frustrating, but I guess, necessary step along that path. OK. The legislative expression of these sentiments that you're describing is Bill C-69, the new uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, Assessment uh, Act, which is uh, facing a really rough ride in the Senate and a really nasty reception from executives in the energy industry who say this is a bill, I think the opposition leader today called it a bill to block pipelines. Mm. Um, how, do you, how do you respond to those concerns? Well, the, the opposition and, and folks in, some folks in the energy industry are highlighting that uh, it does uh, too much consulting with indigenous peoples uh, and uh, does a little too much environmental science and, and rigor around getting a project right. That's exactly what the Federal Court of Appeals just said we need to do more of. So when the conservatives who couldn't get a pipeline to new markets built over 10 years of trying it, and, and Mr. Harper, I'll give him this. He really tried. Uh, he, he said the best way to do it is to uh, reduce uh, the amount of, of scope of the environmental assessments to make it narrower and easier to qualify for that, uh, and, to, uh, and to not really pay much attention to indigenous peoples, because they're opposed to them. So uh, we'll figure out ways of working around that, and we'll get things built. Well, we saw from their failures to succeed in that that that's not the path that the path instead is going to be, no, have genuine, interested, and, and, and attentive conversations with indigenous people to figure out their concerns, to make sure they're really listened to. And if you, you, know, you have to zigzag the pipeline to get around a burial ground, or if they're really concerned about this traditional spawning river or whatever, there are things that we can try and do, which is not a veto, but is you know, looking for accommodation. That's the way we're likely to get things done. And similarly, on environmental impacts, let's take into account the possible challenges. People are talking a lot about the southern resident killer well uh, pod right now, uh, which is a very particular species that lives off salmon at the mouth of the Fraser River. Um, they are already under tremendous stress from all the marine traffic uh, in, in coming out of the port of Vancouver and of Seattle. What we're, we're very much saying is, can we figure out a way, regardless of whether there's one more tanker a day because of this pipeline or not, can we actually support these marine mammals by reducing overall and by bringing in measures to help them 
regardless of whether the, 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 the pipeline moves forward or not. These are things that we need to do. So being thoughtful about these things, I think most Canadians would understand, is probably the better ways to get things done in the 20th century in a, in a country filled with people who are interested in the environment, in economic growth, in reconciliation, rather than trying to shortcut the situation. So when the Conservatives talk about using you know, legislation to ram this project through, and then we'll use legislation again for the next project and the next project, well, what kind of certainty do you think that's going to give to private investors? It seems to me, though, the consent for these kinds of big projects doesn't, it, 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 it's not binary. It doesn't, it doesn't have an on or an off switch. That people who were really happy that, uh, that um, Energy East didn't go forward and who are really happy that Keystone XL is blocked are not going to say, well, given those two, sure, I'll, 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 I'll go from being a ferocious opponent of Trans Mountain to uh, putting up signs welcoming them. That, that doesn't seem to happen. No, and you can get people on both sides of the spectrum. I mean, you get people on one side of the spectrum who absolutely uh, want the pipeline, uh, but really don't like the carbon price that we're bringing in, the price on pollution. Uh, but uh, they won't, you know, they, 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 they focus on the price on pollution that they don't like. Uh, the people who don't want the pipeline very much like the fact that we're moving forward on a strong, a strong plan to fight climate change with a price on pollution, uh, but they're busy worrying about the pipeline. So you have people who, who focus on the negative aspects, don't look at the positive aspects, but I do find that those are mostly people on the edges of the debate. When I talk to ordinary Canadians, they get it. People I meet in Nanaimo, in the interior of BC, uh, in Quebec, they understand, look, being thoughtful and responsible about how we protect the environment and create good new jobs for the future is something that goes together. They know we have, we're Canada. We're going to develop our resources. Can we do them in better ways? Can we do it in safer ways? Uh, that's something they're interested in. So most people get that this is a complex balancing act we're trying to put forward, not an easy one. It's much easier to sit on one side or the other. But I think people get that, that best interests of this country is uh, to find ways to balance competing interests and both protect our environment and grow the economy together. Sometimes it seems like those encamped opponents of a uh, middle ground solution don't have to be in a numerical majority to win. Well, you don't, you don't see people coming out with signs saying, make a smart compromise, you know? <laughs> you know? Find the middle ground, find the middle ground. You know, the people will automatically mobilize around a polarized position or other. And one of the challenges of politics is, yes, listening to those concerns, because sometimes there are, often there are founded elements in there that you do have to take into account. But for the most people, part, people just know that you know, politics is, is, is tough. I mean, I remember speaking with, with a woman who said, oh, I'm really disappointed that you're moving forward with the Keystone XL, with the, uh, with the uh, TMX pipeline. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I still support you on a whole bunch of other things. I just wish you weren't doing that, but I understand that you feel you need to do it, and I'll still vote for you. I mean, you don't want to get, a, or you'd love to, but you don't often get 100% support for everything you do. People support you or not on a broad range of things, and not even have you been perfect on everything. Are you trying to do the right things, doing a credible job of it, and are you keeping your values at the center of, of uh, the decisions you're making? And on that score, I think we're doing pretty well. While these dramas are playing out over Trans Mountain, um, it sometimes seem that, seems that Canada is increasingly a country where nothing big can get made or done. Uh, and yet you're trying to attract international investment precisely on the idea that Canada is a, uniquely, uh, a, a land of unique opportunity. Um, do these pipeline disputes send a bad message to the world of investment? I think there's, there is a message sent around you know, the fact that for the past you know, 10, 15 years almost, there has been uh, a real challenge brought in by the previous government, but that, that is, is continuing with the, the debates we have now. Uh, but at the same time, we're seeing significant uh, global investment into Canada, whether it's uh, companies like Microsoft or Amazon making investments here, whether it's great Canadian companies like Shopify and others uh, investing, expanding, uh, the GM plants expanding, doing more uh, engineering in Markham. We've, we've had Thomson Reuters coming home to Canada from, uh, from Connecticut. Uh, there are a lot of things that people are noticing is uh, 
you know, happening and is exciting about Canada. And that's been a very positive story that has contributed to creating the half a million full-time jobs that we've created over the past three years in Canada. There was a recent report that suggested that CETA, the Canada-European Trade Agreement, um, although that's not what the letters stand for, but to hell with it, um, that it is, uh, seems to be more attractive in the early going to European exporters than the Canadian exporters. They have dug in and they are starting to send their goods uh, into the Canadian market, which is good for everybody. But the Canadian uh, exporters, perhaps transfixed by the NAFTA dispute, have been a little slower to take up the CETA opportunity? Well, we, we have seen an uh, increase in Canadian exports in general, but yes, I think one of the things I, I remember uh, uh, Bruce Heyman, the old uh, uh, US ambassador uh, uh, to Canada, uh, the last one, uh, told me when he got here, he did a cross-country trip, and he was trying to encourage people to uh, think more internationally in their trading as businesses. And the number of people who said, no, 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 we don't trade internationally, we just sell to the US. Uh, and, and he was sort of you know, tremendously pleased to hear that, of course. But we, we are, in a certain part, uh, in a reflexive habit of, well, we have this great big market literally on our doorstep. Uh, let's access that. It's been part of a shift around diversification that many governments have tried to do, that we're continuing to do, uh, to get people to realize that whether it's the internet, whether it's uh, global supply chains, there are more and more opportunities for Canada uh, to pierce markets around the world, including as a brand. There is an interest in Canada as a place where things are done right, things are done well, things are done responsibly. Um, there's a certain cachet around Canada right now on the world stage. And there's a number of companies that are uh, doing well to benefit from that. But there's more to do, which is why we have a, a, a Minister for Small Business and Export Promotion. I wanted to talk about the other side of the energy environment coin, which is, which is the environment. Um, you have been planning for as long as you've been in office to, to introduce a national carbon plan um, about now, basically in the new year. Is that carbon plan going to be in place in the new year? Yes. How? Uh, we, as I said from the very beginning, I mean, you, you remember in, in 2015 we had our first meeting on the environment, the first minister's meeting on the environment uh, in December of 2015, shortly after getting elected. Uh, where I started by thanking the premiers because I said, yes, for 10 years we had a conservative government in Ottawa that didn't do a lot of leadership on the environment, but provinces and indeed cities moved forward in significant ways uh, to reduce carbon emissions and to be thoughtful about where the way the world is going. Well, now there's a federal government uh, that is going to do its part and we're going to make sure that since 85% of the Canadian economy uh, is already uh, jurisdictions in which there is uh, a price on pollution, we're going to make sure that it's 100% of the Canadian economy because we had uh, Alberta and BC and Ontario and Quebec, our four biggest provinces, uh, put a price on pollution in, in different ways. So we said we're going to make sure it happens right across the country because that's an integral part of making our, our Paris commitment targets and you know, preparing for the jobs and the economy of the future. So I would much rather, in every case, work with the province so the province can design its approach uh, that will meet the same efficiency and stringency and efficacy uh, standards that the other provinces make. Uh, but if someone, in that case it was just Saskatchewan with Brad Wall, uh, doesn't want to be part of it, we'll move forward uh, with a federal backstop that will bring in a price on pollution, because pollution shouldn't be free, uh, and the money we bring in from the price on pollution, we will return directly to the people in the province that it, uh, that it, came, it came from. So we think it's a, a, a fair, reasonable approach. It's certainly within the federal powers to do it. Uh, I'd rather work with the provinces, but if they're not going to be fair uh, and they're going to let their uh, neighbors put a cost on pollution while they continue to make it free for their heavy emitters to pollute, uh, the federal government has to step in and hold the federation together by saying, no, everyone has to have uh, equivalent systems. Is that something you can do as a practical matter if the number of non-cooperating non, non, um, provinces rises to four or five or six? I think that's a bit of a, 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 bit of a, a question we'll see the answer to, uh, a, but I very much doubt that it will rise uh, beyond two or perhaps three. 
we have uh, a very clear understanding by, by, by Canadians right across the country that in order to build good jobs for our kids and you know, strong economies moving forward, we have to. Uh, take in mind the impacts of climate change and the need to fight climate change. I mean, the wildfires, the floods, the hurricanes, the extreme weather events that are increasing in frequency because of climate change are only going to get worse. We need to make sure we are doing what we can uh, to protect future generations. Very little matters as much as this right now. So you're going to head into an election year introducing a new tax that will be felt by consumers a few times a month, and which they know will grow over time? The alternative are people who want to make pollution free. I don't think it should be free to pollute. When, when you have a company pumping uh, raw sewage or effluent or chemicals into a waterway and not bothering to pay to clean it up as it outputs, uh, the cost gets borne by the town downstream, by citizens who no longer can't swim or bathe or eat, drink, in the, drink the water they're from. That's irresponsible. Uh, we should, we do, and we do make companies that pollute uh, limit their pollution or pay for the cleanup of their pollution. That's exactly the principle we're moving forward with. It's about basic fairness. People who pollute uh, should be paying for it. And that's, uh, that's a way not just of uh, bringing in uh, revenue to offset the costs of that pollution that is on, on people, but it's also a way of incentivizing not polluting. If it's free to pollute, why would you put in something to protect or prevent pollution? If it costs you something to pollute, well, maybe it's cheaper to actually clean it up at the source instead of polluting in the first place. It's a, it's a basic, small c conservative environment, uh, economic principle uh, around including ex extra, internalizing externalities. Uh, that's something that, that you know, the big c conservatives don't seem to get. And I'm still waiting for uh, Andrew Scheer's promised, you know, comprehensive, detailed uh, plan to fight climate change that won't include a price on pollution. Uh, I think we're all waiting for that, but I, I think uh, none of us should hold our breath. Will this nest of issues be on the agenda for the First Minister's meeting that you're posting in some number of weeks from now? We are focused uh, on the thorny issue of internal trade. Uh, there has been, uh, I mean, actually CETA sort of highlighted it for, uh, for a lot of folks, where suddenly um, people in, uh, in Europe had better access to um, certain procurement or, or opportunities in Canada uh, than one province had for another. Uh, as we talk about diversifying trade, as we talk about reducing barriers and gaining efficiencies in the Canadian economy, reducing some of those interior barriers to trade uh, is an easy win scenario for, for Canadians, for workers, and for our economy. Um, we've got a little bit of time left. I wanted to let McLean's readers uh, have at you because we got a lot of interest uh, both in, in all the issues that I've discussed and in a few that we haven't asked about before. And so I'm going to pass along a few uh, questions that came from McLean's readers. Um, one is asking what you have to say about the, the arrest in British Columbia of Ibrahim Ali, who was a Syrian refugee, following the murder of a teenage girl named Marissa Shen. Uh, obviously, it, it's uh, uh, devastating news for, for her family, for her friends. It's a terrible tragedy. Anytime uh, if someone is murdered, it's a, it's a terrible thing. Uh, I trust our justice system. I trust uh, our system to, uh, to you know, go through its processes to both um, apply consequences to this and uh, to make sure that we're, we're thinking about how we continue to keep people safe. A lot of people say that, some people say that, if it hadn't been for the surge in Syrian refugees after the 2015 election, uh, guys like this guy would not be here. I'm not one of those people who said that. Um, another question from another reader. Again, uh, not the only reader who's concerned about the promise on electoral reform that, uh, that uh, didn't quite see for Peter Martin says, I live in a rural riding that has never and will never elect a liberal. My vote is wasted. Seems to be a liberal voter. Uh, real electoral reform was important to me. Why did you abandon your promise and voters like me? We were um, 
heading down a path that I thought, uh, despite all my hopes and best intentions, and indeed uh, my uh, wish to move forward on this promise, it looked like we were going in a bad direction that would have ended up hurting Canada. Uh, and if given a choice between ticking a box off on a platform uh, or doing damage to Canada, I'm, uh, and doing damage to Canada, I will choose uh, to uh, not accomplish that promise uh, in order to keep our democracy and our, our country stable. Could you not have foreseen that in 2015 when you made the promise? No, I was genuinely, genuinely hopeful that we were going to be able to come to uh, an arrangement where, for example, uh, uh, you could have a ranked ballot uh, that would go at this problem here without uh, empowering fringe voices in, in our country. Um, do you have any appetite for taking up this issue again after the next election? Uh, I've, I've said many times it would have to be uh, on, if one of the other parties were to come forward with a uh, workable proposal, I would look at it, uh, but it's not something I'm going to seek to do alone anymore. Okay. Uh, another question, following on a lot of uh, questions, similar questions from readers about the Me Too movement. Uh, this is a reader named Sabrina S. She wants to know how the Prime Minister reconciles his past groping experience with his self-branding and bragging as a feminist? Should or would one cancel out the other or can the two coexist in 2018? I think, I think first of all, we have to understand that there is a massive shift going on uh, in our society, in our workplaces, and important conversations that are really, really long overdue. Uh, understanding that uh, someone can experience an interaction very differently from another person and giving weight and credence and support to anyone who comes forward to share those stories uh, and those experiences is extremely important. And how we listen and how we learn and how we grow as a society is absolutely essential. So I'm, I'm, I will always, uh, as I did, make space uh, for, for people to come forward uh, and, and not seek to shut them down or contradict them but to support them. And it's, it's difficult, uh, but there's a lot of difficult conversations we have to have. And if, if, if you know, leaders can be part of modeling the path forward of being thoughtful and supportive, uh, then, then all the better for it. One of your other MPs, Kent Hare, uh, was kicked out of cabinet over a series of allegations. Uh, and then this... Uh, Earlier this summer, you were campaigning for him in his writing. Mm -hmm. How do you arbitrate between these? I mean, well, I, mean, I think first of all, it's it's obvious that you know when I became leader of the Liberal Party, I didn't get a, a, a book of instructions handed down by Wilfrid Laurier on how to deal with these situations. They, these are these are new situations that we have to go at on a case by case basis in a in a thoughtful way, uh, in a way that uh, really. Um, tries to adjust to uh, the fact that people have been marginalized and taken advantage of and not heard uh, for, a, for far too long. And we are now uh, giving voice to those. So we are trying to deal with them each as they come up in the most thoughtful way possible. I seem to have, there we go. I seem to have worn out my microphone. Maybe I should just talk into your lapel. Um, Here's a broader question. Uh, one of the readers asks, what do you feel has been the most important lesson you've learned so far in your term as prime minister? How has this lesson affected the way you govern or the way you intend to govern in the future? Hmm. Um, I think it really does have to do with, with listening. Um, and listening in a way that does not close off people who disagree with you. Uh, and that's, that's really the, the big reflection that I'm having these days, uh, and that I think we're all having, is around the polarization and populism and the eroding of democracy we see around the world and worried that it might end up happening in Canada. And I think one of the surefire signs that it's happening is when people start uh, closing their ears and their hearts 
uh, to people who think very differently from them. So for me, being in a position of, 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 of leadership, making sure that I am not uh, discounting or shutting down people with differing views is really important to me. I think my, and, and obviously there, there are folks, particularly conservatives, who might disagree with me on this one or, or disagree with what I say is my approach on this, but my approach is very much about allowing people to make their own choices and figure out their own expression of their own lives and how they move forward. And if you can create a society in which you know, women and marginalized communities and new arrivals and indigenous peoples all have greater opportunities to share their perspectives and their voices and be empowered, then you are increasing the well-being and, and success and resilience of that society, even though you are bringing in challenging voices that don't necessarily like how the status quo has been because they've been marginalized in many cases by it. So where we have you know, folks out there who will say that I am, for example, uh, limiting uh, an MP's right to express themselves when I say, no, if you want to be a liberal MP, you can't uh, vote against a woman's right to choose. My choice is I am actually going to prevent people from restricting other people's rights. So if you want to be a liberal MP, you can't vote to take away rights from anyone else. And that's, that's the fundamental basis on it. So being open to hearing all these broad voices, listening to them, and seeking to create a path forward that leaves room for everyone while being anchored on your core values is, uh, is the path I choose to walk and that we walk carefully, but it constantly reinforces the need to actually genuinely listen to people who do feel like the choices we're making are not aligned with their, uh, their values or their hopes. I want to follow up on that, um, if anyone can hear me, on, on, the, uh, on the issue of the attestations that applicants for the summer jobs program were asked mm. to uh, sign uh, this spring le leading into the summer. There's an interfaith group that says, Muslims, Christians, and Jewish uh, community organizations, that say that 1,400 applications were turned down, up from 127 a year earlier. Do you really think that 1,300, 1,200, 1,300 of those groups were planning to run anti-abortion propaganda mills, or I, was the I rule? I hope not. Was the rule way too uh, draconian? No, I don't think it was draconian at all. I, I don't think we should be sending uh, federal funding uh, for students uh, who will be engaged in activities designed to limit another person's uh, rights and freedoms. That's not something, I, and certainly there are anti-abortion groups out there, and they have every right to exist. I just don't think they should receive federal funding. Uh, and the attestation, unfortunately, uh, was used as a bit of a political, uh, political tool by uh, right-wing groups in general to try and, uh, to try and make their point. Uh, and because of it, a lot of community organizations that are doing perfectly good, good and essential work, you know, faith-based uh, day camps and things like that. It had nothing to do uh, with uh, anti-abortion uh, uh, propaganda or actions or, in, in other cases, uh, are not limiting choices for LGBT youth, for example, uh, got caught up in uh, the choice that conservatives made to politicize this. When we were very clear, if you're not going out and you know, trying to limit people's charter rights, then you can tick the box in that attestation, no problem. Okay. Um, we've only got a few more minutes left. I want to ask about some video that came out of Winnipeg last week. You met with indigenous leaders. The video showed you um, uh, exhibiting some concern that they were taking longer to talk than you thought you had to, to be with them. And uh, there's been a lot of criticism that this shows the same old colonial attitudes uh, on the part of some people in the indigenous communities. Uh, we had, I was very excited about sitting down with the uh, uh, Federation of uh, Sovereign uh, Indigenous Nations, uh, the FSIN uh, in Saskatchewan. Uh, it was, we had our caucus meeting in Saskatoon. I had an hour to meet with them. We were supposed to meet 
uh, with uh, eight representative leaders from across the province who are going to uh, share the concerns of their communities. Uh, unfortunately, about 50 or 60 people showed up. Uh, and they were divided into three groups. And instead of the first group taking the 20 minutes that it was able to take, ended up taking 45, 50 minutes. Uh, and I wasn't chairing the meeting. So I certainly couldn't interrupt people as they were speaking. But then when the next groups came in, uh, they, were, they had much more to say than the 10 minutes remaining for them. And that was really frustrating to me because uh, I wanted them to have an opportunity to express themselves. But because of uh, decisions made uh, earlier around management of the meeting, um, there wasn't an opportunity to demonstrate the kind of genuine interaction, genuine uh, respectful nation-to-nation -nation relationship that is so important to me. So yeah, I, this is something that matters deeply to me. And I was frustrated that there were a number of people who'd driven hours to come uh, sit down and meet with the Prime Minister who weren't able to uh, because uh, there was some poor time management uh, taken by the organizers of the meeting. And I'm the guy who said Manitoba when I should have said Saskatchewan. It's a good thing I'm not running for anything next year. Um, I think we will wrap it up. Obviously, we could, we could, uh, we could talk for hours. Um, but I know that you're pretty good about saying yes to requests for an interview, so we'll try and have you back another time. Um, I want to thank our uh, sponsors, the Canadian Bankers Association, our media partners at CPAC, and our friends at the National Arts Centre who, who always give us this fantastic room to have these conversations in. There is a reception next door afterwards. I hope to see you all there. Thanks very much. Good night.